And the, the, this table is on Blackboard. If you want to, you can go to Blackboard. You can download it. It's an Excel file. It's called Population One of 100. And basically, uh, Excel has a function in it that will allow you to create a set of random numbers. Okay. In this case, and you can define that set of numbers by the mean that you want and by the standard deviation you want. And it assigns a whole table of random numbers for you. This particular table, we'll, we'll do it right now. We'll figure out what the mean, that, we're going to assume for a moment that this is a population. Obviously, populations that you're going to be working with in the future are going to be considerably larger than this. But we're going to make believe that there is a population. Well, I got a whole bunch of people online. Okay. Uh, just uh, while I'm doing this, perhaps one of you guys online could just type into the chat box so that I know you can see and hear me. I just muted uh, everybody so that we won't get any background noise. Thank you very much. Terrific. Okay, so we have this table of 100 random numbers. We're going to calculate the average for it now, the mean. Uh, and this, since it's a population, I'm actually going to call it mu. Okay, so the average of this po average for this entire population, the mean value for this entire population, and the number red numbers on the outside are just locators, ways for us to identify which number that we're working on. In other words, by row and column, kind of the way we would with Excel anyway. Okay, so the average value here is about 50. We can also calculate a standard deviation. And of course, that of course for a population, since we know the entire population. I'm going to call that sigma. That's equal to the standard deviation for all of the values in this table. In real life, it turns out to be 9. In real life, we're not going to be capable of, in most cases, sampling an entire population. And if we could, we would need a lot of the statistics that we're learning here. A lot of it has to do with Sampling mechanics, right? So if we could just sample, if we could just sample the entire population, we would know exactly what the mean is, what the standard deviation is, and so on and so forth. Okay, so most of the time we can't, uh, almost all of the time we can't do that. We're forced instead to work with samples from that population, and first off, from that sample about that population. Okay, so what we're going to make believe here is is that this is the entire population. We happen to know that the mean is fifty. Most cases, we never know what the mean. We'll never find out what the true mean is. But in this case, we happen to know it. We happen to know standard deviation is 9. In real life, out of this population of 100 people, we might have the resources to do a random sample of, say, I'm going to make up a number like 9 people out of this 100. So I'm going to take a random sample from this population of 100 people uh, that's a, that has a size of 9, 9 individuals. Okay, so anybody want to suggest a good way for me to take a random sample from this? Well, you know, just picking and that kind of stuff, probably not random, right? I mean, if you're right-handed, you're going to tend, and if you're left-handed, you might see numbers in there you like, like your birthday or something like that, right? So that's not going to be really random. There's a few ways that we can get around that. One way, I'll, I'll mention three, three different ways. One way is, is that there, there is a function in Excel which will generate random numbers. Now, it seems a little counterintuitive to write a program that generates random numbers. You know, it's a, a device that's programmed, right? But presumably, it's drawing some reference from somewhere else. Okay, let me just get to this. And I think that it's equal to random, R-A-N-D, parentheses, zero, close parentheses. I think I got that right. Oh. An error. Hang on a second here. Just parentheses. No zero. Just rand. That's a random number. If I hit enter again, if I uh, 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 if I do anything else in this table, it's going to change. Each time I make a modification in the table, it recalculates and gives me a new random number. The only problem is, is that obviously that's a random number between zero and one. Okay, we may not want particularly want that, so my next step might be, let's say I want to generate 10 random numbers. I might want to copy that down. Okay, there is 10 random numbers. Okay, 
So next thing I might be interested in, well, maybe I want a random number between uh, 0 and 100. Okay, so I'm going to just take this number here and multiply it by 20. Oops. That's going to be 20 times that number. And I'll copy this down. Notice every time I do this, it keeps generating a new table of random numbers. Let's say I want them to be integers. So I'm going to tell it to round it. Round it, and here's the number we want to round, and the number of digits that we want, whoops, comma, number of digits that we want is two. Whoops. Wants a comma. Whoops. Comma. Whoops. Actually, I want zero. Zero decimals. Okay, so now we have a rounded number. And I'm going to copy this all the way down. Okay, randomly generated ta table of numbers that are uh, 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 two digits, no decimal places. Of course, every time I do something with this, it's going to recalculate this. So what I might want to do is I might go up here and say copy that list of numbers, and then go over here and say paste special. Okay, and what I want to do is paste only the values themselves, not the not the uh, 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 the uh, uh, function. And there's my table pasted. Notice the other ones all changed. That one didn't change. That, that We've got that stored away. That's one way for us to generate random numbers. And in this case, I might have wanted to generate numbers from 0 to 100 or so that we would get a bunch of two-digit numbers that might represent row and column numbers. So that's one, one way we might do that. Another way we might do that is to go online and there's a website, I think it's called random.org. Oops. Okay, and it goes through a whole discussion of it, but it's also got a uh, numbers. Free service, integer generator. And you can go in here and you can tell it the sequence that you want, where you want to start from, and so on. it'll generate random numbers for you as well. So we got three different ways. Oh, I, two. I got ahead of myself, too. I also put one on Blackboard for you. Uh, you know, as it ha this came from another textbook. This is something called the random number table. It's a published table of random numbers. Okay, it's Some of them, they have books that are literally volumes of random numbers. These have already been generated from somewhere else. We don't have one in our textbook, strangely enough. Most, most uh, statistics textbooks at least have some short abbreviated random number table. We don't have one. So in this case, these numbers have all been generated for you. And there's pages and pages of them. Okay, so one of the ways that we could use this is that we could just start anywhere, like here, and we could use the numbers that are printed here in sequence. The first number is 25, second number is 25 again, third number is 54, double zero, 29. So on and so forth, a strange series of numbers there. Right? So we're going to use these numbers, and what I'm going to ask you guys to do is I'm going to ask you guys to use one of these three methods, probably this would be the easiest since you have it in front of you right now, to randomly select nine numbers from that table. So two-digit number, so for instance, if I start here, 41 is the number that's in row four, wherever I put it, row four, column one. Row four, column one would be... 48. Okay, so I'm going to start with that one. You guys get you make your own. Just pick out nine numbers. Okay, I'm going to do it with you, as a matter of fact. Okay, you guys online, if you want, you can also join us on this. Oops. You can join us on this, and then as you um, uh, complete the, uh, as you do it, find the average of your nine numbers and type them into the chat box. You guys just can yell it to me as you do it. Start anywhere on the table. That's the whole point, yeah. Start anywhere on the table. Uh, 19, let's see. You can go any direction you want. I'm going to go straight down. Oh, 5 and 4, 7. Okay, 
And the last one, twelve and then sixty eight. Okay, so now I am going to find my average for that set of numbers. Except I'm going to call this one x-bar because it's a sample average, sample mean. Okay, I'm going to have you guys ask you guys to round that up or down to the nearest whole number. I'm going to call mine 48. Just makes things simple as we go through this. Let's see if anybody. Else. Okay. Okay, we got a 49, I see. Online. Anybody want to yell one out to me? 50. Some more? I'm sorry. 40, 48, okay. Got 54 online. Couple more. 53. 49 online. Just need a couple more. 44. How about one more? Anybody? 45. 45. What was that? Uh, 47. 47. Okay, good. That's enough for now. Okay, there's 47 online also. Okay. All right. So now, first of all, what do we notice about the values that we got for an average of nine, uh, a sample of nine people? How do they compare to the range of numbers for the actual population? Much narrower range. Right. That, that's intuitively you would think that. Right. Because you're sampling the entire population. You would expect the, the when you take a sample of size nine, that the number you're going to get is closer to the mean, the middle than the extremes. You wouldn't expect to get all nine people at one extreme and all nine people at the other extreme and get a very, uh, 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 very, uh, very extreme value for the average can happen, especially if you do a lot of samples, you might come across one like that. But it's more, much more likely it's going to be closer to the middle, right? So, so the variability is much less. What about the average? X bar, let's see what the average is. X bar for the sample means, right? This is for the sample means. Okay, that's going to be equal to average. The mean for these samples is 49. Okay. Very interesting. Okay, so the mean for the samples is 49. That's really close to 50, isn't it? Right? Did a pretty good job of, of estimating it. If we had a larger sample, do you think it would be a better estimate or a worse estimate? Probably be a better estimate. Probably be closer. Likely to be closer to the mean. Okay, so now... Let's take, we know that the mean for our sample of size, repeated samples of size 9, we know that the mean is 49. We also know from the central limit theorem, what is the distribution of these numbers going to be like? They're going to be normally distributed. Most of them are going to be close to the mean. Some of, so half of them will be low. If we take an infinite number of samples, half the time they'll be below the population mean, half the time above the sample, and they're, but they're going to be normally distributed. But 
Because there's less variability, we would expect the standard deviation for these values, these repeated samples of size 9, to be a smaller standard deviation. So let's calculate it. Okay, it comes out to about 3. So you guys see a relationship between the standard deviation for the population and the standard deviation for the samples? About three. What's the relationship between three and nine? Three times. Three times. It's a square root, right? Remember, we just saw a we just saw an example that told we just saw a uh, 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 a formula that told us that the relationship between the variability and the sample means. Is the is the set is the population standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size? In this case, sample size is nine, so we would expect the the standard deviation for the sample means to be uh, the standard deviation nine divided by the square root of the sample size nine. Nine divided by three is roughly three, and that's pretty close to what we got right now. That's the first one. Then one that's like a Christmas miracle. It never happens like that. Most other classes, I usually don't get this close. But it, but this is pretty pretty um, uh, a dramatic demonstration of that relationship. Okay. The only problem is now you know it gets pretty confusing here. Now I, I have a standard deviation for the uh, uh, population. Now I got a standard deviation for the sample mean. So we're going to assign a special name to that. Anybody remember what that was? Standard error, right? That's going to be the standard error of the mean. Okay, so now let's take a look at what that tells us. We have a relationship now. And we're going to get on to some examples here very, very shortly. We have a relationship now where we have a population that had a mean of uh, 50 and a standard deviation of 9. So... 95% of the people in this population are going to have a value, a score or value, between what two numbers? Yeah, exactly. 68 and less than that is 32. Right? Two standard deviations above the mean, two standard deviations below the mean. Now, if I take repeated samples from the same population of size 9, it's going to be narrower distribution. Now, these are samples. What would I expect the average sample mean to be if I took a lot of samples of size 9? Same as the, same as the population, because half the time it would be a little less, half the time a little bit more. Okay, so the sample mean is going to be 50. What do I expect the standard deviation of those sample means to be? Except I'm going to call it standard error instead, right? Sigma over the square root of n. And what do we wind up getting? What was that? Okay, was, uh, do we call it like three? Let's call it three, right? Nine over the square root of uh, nine, uh, which is three. So our standard error is three. Now, if I asked you, where would 95% of these sample needs fall? What range would they fall within? Right? Again, st still two standard deviations below, two standard errors below the mean, and two standard errors above the mean. So our 95% of our samples are going to wind up between uh, uh, 40, 44 and 56, right? Okay, so we have a relationship we can take advantage of here. Okay. So if, we, if I knew that the mean was 50 and I were to take a sample, I could predict ahead of time. I'm 95% sure the result of that sample mean is going to come out between 44 and 56. What if I want to be? What if I want? What if I want to be 99 percent sure? What's that? Deviate. Uh, in other words, the, the standard error is three, but two standard deviations away. St two standard errors to the left and to the right. Standard standard error is the same as the standard deviation, but it applies to the sample means, repeated samples. Okay, so in other words, uh, it, would be, it would be two standard deviations below the mean, two times three, and two standard deviations above the mean, two times three. This is negative, this is positive. So six below to six above. Score six. Uh, because 
because the uh, remember the empirical formula told us that 95% of the results are within two standard deviations below the mean and two standard deviations above. Oh, now I'm talking about, okay, good. You got ahead of me there. Let's talk about 99%. What if I wanted to predict how far apart, what, what the range of, po of possible outcomes might be for 99% of these samples I might take from this? So the, I'm sorry, three standard deviations. Exact three standard de minus three plus three standard deviations. Let's go to let's go to our z table, right? First thing I want to talk about on our z table is is that when I talk about ninety five percent range, ninety five percent of results being within two standard deviations, do I really mean two standard deviations? Is it really exactly two standard deviations? Well, you know that would imply if it was that would imply that two below a two above we'd have two and a half percent of the area of this curve down at this end and 2.5% at this end, right? So let's take a look at our table, our Z table, Z table. Okay, so let's look at the Z score that we need to get to 2.5% to the left of that Z score. So let's see, the areas in here are all the areas on the curve, and this is the area to the left. So we're looking for 0.0. 0 0.025, 0 0.0, 0 0.0256, 250. Here we go. That's 2.5% right there. So what's the Z score for that value? Negative 1.96. Not quite 2, right? It's really one, negative 1.96. So 95% so of the results would be between 1.96 standard deviations below the mean, or standard average below the mean, and 1.96 above. If I wanted to be, if I wanted to predict where 99% of these possible sample means might come out, I would have to use a different number, right? Well, 99% means I'm willing to uh, accept 1% error, which means I could have an extreme of half a percent on one end and half a percent on the other end. Let's see where that is. Half a percent, 0 0.005. 0 0.005. Well, the closest that I can see to that, it's kind of a toss up here, is negative 2.58 standard deviations to the left and to the right, wider, right? 99% confidence that I'm going to, that, that, that my sample will have that value is going to be 2.58 standard deviations on either side. How about if I was willing to accept less confidence? How about 90% confidence? We could accept 5% on each tail, right? So where's 5%? I'm going to cheat and tell you right off the bat. It's 1.64, right? That's 1.64. It's about 5% each tail. So 99% confidence that, I'll, that the sample is going to wind up there is uh, 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 1.96. 90% is 1.64. And 99% is 2.58. Don't bother writing this down because before the semester is over, it's going to be burned into your brain. I guarantee you. Okay, those three numbers. For sure, if you remember nothing else about this course, you'll remember those three numbers. Now, I'm going to turn that around now. And I'm going to turn that around by saying instead, let's say that instead of saying that I can, knowing the population mean, I can now predict what the likelihood of getting a sample of size nine from that population to have a certain average, let's turn it around now and say to ourselves, well, I take a sample and my sample came out to be, in this case, my mean came out to be, what did we say it was, 49 or something like that. Okay, and our standard, de our standard error came out to be three. Let me work this the other way around. I'm gonna start with my mean, oops, X bar. I'm gonna start with my mean and I'm going to add and subtract that interval, that margin of error that we're talking about. In fact, I'm going to call it a margin of error. Right? Well, what is that margin of error really? X bar plus or minus the Z score that I want to use depending on what my level of confidence is going to be. Okay, I'm going to say, I'm going to say for right now, I'm going to say 95%. Right? The Z score for 95% times my standard error. And my standard error, of course, is equal to sigma over the square root of n. In this case, 9 over 9 over 9. Uh, 9 over 3 is 3. 
Okay, so in our case, in the case we just had, uh, uh, we found 49 was our mean for one sample. My sample is 49, right? Plus or minus the z score is 1.96 times our standard error, which is 3 calculated from the population standard deviation. So what is our range that we would expect to see samples, assuming that we got this part right? It's going to be 49 plus or minus, and uh, let's see, I'm going to estimate that. That looks like uh, 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 2 would be 6 less, that's going to be 6, 5, point eight, eight, what? 8, 8, okay, good, 5.88. So, so, uh, and, and if I add subtract that, I'm going to wind up with 40, uh, nope, no, uh, yeah, 42.12, right? What, 43.12, right? And on the high end, I'm going to wind up with 50, uh, 54.88. So essentially, what I found here is, is that I'm 95% sure that the true mean, the population mean, is between 43.12 and 54.81. Well, let's think about that for a second. I take a sample. My sample says, gee, it looks like the mean is 49. Problem with that is we don't really know how close to the mean we really are. So we want to have some, some clue how certain we are that we're close to the mean or where the mean really lies. Okay, while we can't, we can't say for sure how close we are to the mean, we can apply this to predict that the true mean is, within, is between 43 and 55. Okay. So that has some value now, right? We may not know exactly what it is, but we know that it's within a certain range. Do we know that it's within that range for sure? No, we don't. What's our level of confidence that we've captured the mean though? 95% certain that we've captured the mean. So, okay, so now let's, let's think about this. If I were to ask you, I want to find a confidence interval where I'm 99% sure that I've captured the mean, is that interval going to be wider or narrower? Right. It's got to be wider, right, obviously, because the wider it is, the more likely. And why is it going to be wider mathematically? Because what, instead of 1.96, what are we going to use? We're going to use 2.58. Okay. And if I'm willing to uh, uh, accommodate a lower level of confidence and say I'm, I'm willing to be 90% confident, have a 90% confidence interval, is that going to be narrower or wider now? It's going to be now. We can afford to have a narrower range because we're willing to have a lower level of confidence. So what number are we going to use for, for uh, Z there? Anybody remember? I told you not to remember it, so now I'm asking you what it is. Okay, 1.64. Okay. okay. All right, good. Let's try some examples. Okay, how are we doing on time? Oh, we're good on time. Good. Okay, there's a couple of documents. I just uploaded two more recently. Um, 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 and I think I got them on the desktop here. Yes. Yes. Uh, for 99 percent, uh, I was just saying for 90 percent, it was 1.64. Okay, so one of the two documents that I just uploaded. Okay, let me, before I go a little further, before I go uh, further, I'm I'm kind of like twisting this around a little bit. I just want to clarify something. When we're talking about a confidence interval, what we're really saying is is that, uh, like in the case we just had, what did I say was 43 to, 44 to 56 or something like that? 43 to 56, right? What I'm saying, when I have 95% confidence interval of 43 to uh, 56, what I'm saying is, is that, how, how will I describe this? Here is my range. of those two values. Okay. Uh, if I repeat this a hundred times, how many times am I going to actually capture? Yeah, I'm going to say that this is 43, 
and this is 56. If I did this with 100 different populations, if I did this 100 times, how many times would I actually capture the, the mean, with, uh, the true population mean within these two values? Now, 95 out of 100 times, right? If I did it 20 times, 19 out of 20 times. Presumably, one out of every 20 times, I'd be either lower or higher, right? Because I would miss it. Because I, yeah, I could make it 99%. I can make it 99.9%. The further apart those, that range becomes, the less useful that it becomes to us as well, less defining that it becomes. Okay, let's go to, let's go to the videotape here. Let's do an example or two. Okay, first one, just to distinguish when we're dealing with a population and when we're dealing with a uh, sample. Uh, the mean of a population is known to be 160. Notice it says mu. The standard deviation of the population is known to be 18. Okay, sigma. What would be the probability that a single observation selected at random from the population would have a value of less than 142? So just a little exercise to, to remember when we're talking about populations. 160, 18, and 142. One sixty uh, sigma equals eighteen, and we're looking at one forty two. Okay, so what's the probability that a randomly selected individual from this population is going to have a value of less than one forty two? Okay, how am I going to calculate that again? Okay, calculate my z score for that value. My z score for that value is going to be the value minus mu over Sigma. Okay, or 142 minus 160 over 18. So that's 18 over 18. One standard deviation below. What's that? Minus one. Minus one. Good, thank you. Minus one. Minus one indicates it's to the right. And since the table that we're using to calculate this gives us the area to the left and actually gives us two pages, one for negative values and one for positive values. All I have to go is go find that, that uh, z-score of 1.0, 1.00, and it's 15.87. So the area to the left of that is 15.87%, or 0.1587. Of course, we've already seen, because we did exam one, and we already saw that we can manipulate this, and now we know what the probability of uh, randomly selecting someone that's more than 142. That's going to be 1 minus that. Right, the remaining area. Right? Everybody agrees with me? Right? Right. In other words, this area here would be 1 minus uh, 0 0.1587. In other words, 16% down here, so the rest of it's going to be 84%. All right, so next point. What is the probability a single observation is greater than 166? Okay, same deal. It's equal to x. 166 minus 160 over 18. That happens to be 6 over 18. It's positive this time, which is equal to 0.333. Our z-score is plus 0.333 in that case. Okay, so let's go back to our z-table. So we're going to use this second part of the curve. Okay, Now, it's, it's past the mean. right? So it's a positive z-score. It's past the mean, so it's going to be more than 50%. So 0 0.033, yes, no problem, okay, 0 0.033 is going to be 62.93, 6293. But that area represents the area from here down. In other words, 60.6293. That's all of this area in here. Okay, so if we're interested in the area above that, it's going to be 1 minus 0 0.333. 0 0.667, I guess. Right, and if we want the area between 142 and 166, well, that's going to be 0 0.623, right, the whole area here, less this area, 0 0.6293, minus this area, which is 0 0.1587. I'm not going to bother actually do the math there. But you can see that there's a lot of ways we can manipulate this. But 
up to this point, what are we dealing with at this stage? We're dealing with population parameters, mu and sigma. Okay, so now let's take a look at the, let's take another look at this when we're going to start to deal with samples. In fact, this one's kind of similar. A random sample of size 36 has a mean X bar, not mu X bar, of 165. Assume the population is normally distributed with a standard deviation of 18. Sounds familiar. Now, but notice what I did there. I gave you X bar, but I also gave you, did I give you the standard deviation? No, I gave you the standard, I gave you sigma for the entire population. Next week, well, the reason why I'm doing that is for the moment, look at it this way. If we don't know the mean, we have a problem. That's, we have a level of uncertainty, right? That's why we're dealing with a confidence interval rather than you know, pronouncing what the mean is. If I don't know what sigma is, and the only way for me to deduce what the standard deviation is is from the sample, I've just added another level of uncertainty, right? So for the first few problems here, I'm going to assume that we know, even though we, we don't know the mean, we had to do it by taking a sample, find the mean by taking a sample, I'm going to assume that we know the standard deviation. This is an outside of the realm of possibility. You could have some other study that did similar work and there was an enormous sample and you feel you have a really good handle on the standard deviation. You might draw that, that sigma from that, from that study and apply it here to your new sample. But for the most part, you're not going to know what the standard, de the mean or the standard deviation for an entire population. Okay, but for now, we're going we're gonna to short circuit that so we can make things a little bit sam simpler. Okay, so one of the things that will avoid, uh, that we'll be able to avoid is worrying about sample size if we know sigma. Okay. We know, if we know sigma, we don't have to worry about sample size being too small or too big. Okay, so let's see. Calculate the standard error for samples of size 36. Okay, so what's that going to be? Standard error is equal to sigma over the square root of n. Right, that's, uh, what was it? It's 18 over, 30, it's over 6, right? Okay, that's going to be equal to 3. Okay. Compute the 95% confidence interval for the population mean, population mean mu. Okay, so what's mu going to be equal to? It's going to be equal to x bar plus or minus. It's 95% confidence interval. What value of z am I going to use? Good. Times the standard error. Okay. So what was x bar? It was 160 plus or minus 1.96 times 3. Okay, so it's going to be 160 plus or minus, uh, that would be 6. That's a, we just did this, right? Uh, 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 uh. Good, thank you. Okay, and so it's going to be our 95% confidence interval is going to be uh, 165.88, and down here is going to be 154.12. That's our 95% confidence interval. Now, if I wanted a, if I wanted a 99% confidence interval, what what's the change that I would make here? Right, that would be 2.5. But okay, how about a 90% confidence interval? Bingo. Exactly right. Okay. Okay. And in fact, that was the next three questions. Okay. Let's take a look at um, uh, uh, 3A. A random sample of uh, si sample size has a mean of 150. Assume the population is normally distributed with a standard deviation of 30. Uh, calculate it. Well, you, you guys do 3A. Basically the same problem. Change a few numbers. Okay. You guys do it on your own and I'll do it also. I'm going, to, I'm going to hide my screen while I'm doing it. How about that? So we see if we get the same answer. It's going to go up. I think it just holds it. Let me see if that. Yeah, okay. I changed my screen. It didn't change. That didn't change. Don't freak out at home. Well, it'll be back.
nah. For 90, uh, for, uh, remember it was 2.58, 1.96, and 1.64. Okay, so what do we have here? We have 150, 30. Was that number? Okay. Okay, I'm going to turn my screen on so we can compare notes. Okay, this is what I got. I'm going to start with the lowest level of confidence, 90%. 141.8 to 158.2. That's my narrowest range. My 95% confidence interval was on the top there, 140.2 to 
and my highest, my uh, highest level of confidence and my widest interval is 137.1 to 162.9. Did I do it right? You guys agree with me? Anybody online? Anybody online? Uh, well, I see some online. 160. Let's see, 99% confidence interval. Uh, 137. Yeah, looks like every, it looks like we're in agreement. Okay. Any questions about that calculation? Right. Now let's go, let's start another curve here. Um, another parameter that you might be dealing with, a point estimate that you might be dealing with, is a proportion. Okay, so, okay, let's see. Um, 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 I'm going to use the value P to represent the proportion for a population. If I use P to represent the proportion for a population, in other words, a parameter, I need to use something else to represent a proportion in a sample. So I'm going to use something called P cap. It's like, like X bar except a little cap on top like that. Okay. So that's going to represent the proportion in a uh, in a uh, uh, sample. Okay, so let's say that I sample uh, voters um, uh, randomly uh, on the street, um, really randomly, not on the street. I have some sort of mechanism for randomizing phone numbers and so on and so forth, and I have registered voters, uh, likely voters, for instance, and I call them up. And let's say I call up 100 voters. And I ask them, uh, are you voting for Hillary Clinton in November? Right? And out of 100, I get 58 voters that say that they're voting for Hillary Clinton. Okay. So is that P or is that P cap? It's P cap, right? It's a sample. Right? And how did I get that, that proportion, that P cap? It's a 58 divided by 100. It's 0 0.58. 58% or 0 0.58 of the voters say that you're going to vote for the way clean, right? So now I want to know, I want to know, well, I only sampled 100 voters. I don't know what P is. There's, there's 200, there's 100, um, I guess, how many people voted in the last election? Uh, eight, um, uh, I guess maybe about 100 million or something like that. Somewhere, maybe a little less than 100 million. Maybe there were like 90 million voter, voters in the last election. I'm, I, I'm not going to know what the result of that 90 million people voting, the, in other words, the actual proportion of voters for Hillary Clinton, until that election takes place. All I know now is the proportion that, vote, that say they're going to vote for Hillary Clinton based on my sample of 100 people. Okay. So actually, and I'm going to make that, uh, no, it's okay, let's leave it 100. Keep things simple. Okay, so now... Since I, since I, all I know is my point value for my estimate of that proportion, P cap, I want to have some sort of handle on how close I am, how, how well I know what the likelihood is that that num number of people really vote for Hillary Clinton. Since I can't tell how accurate that number is, I, uh, uh, what, I, what, I, what I will settle for is an idea of a, ra is a range of numbers that will tell me what my confidence interval is for the true proportion based on the number of people that I've sampled. Okay, anybody remember what the formula for standard error for a proportion is? Square root, right? P times one minus P over, okay, whole thing under, under there. Now, I don't know P, do I, right? It would be nice to know P, like the population standard deviation, uh, uh, the population standard sigma, the population standard. I don't know it, so I'm stuck using P cap instead of using P. On the other hand, when we're dealing with these kinds of surveys, our sample size is normally very large. So we allow ourselves that accommodation to use P cap instead of, instead of really knowing what P is. So let's find this square root of 0.58. By the way, sometimes instead of 1 minus p, though, you'll see p times q. Right? Q is 1 minus p, if you see that. Now, 0.58 times 0.42, 1 minus p, over 100. That's going to be our standard error. 
So I'm going to pull up my calculator to do that. Okay, and let's see, 0.58 times 0.42 is equal to this times, oops, ah, let me try that again. Let me clear everything out. 0.58 times 0.42 divided by 100 is equal to that. Now I'm going to take the square root of that. And our result is 0 0.04935, about 4.9%, right? So, or uh, 0 .4, a 0.049 proportion. Okay, so now, how am I going to calculate my confidence interval is? I'm going to do the same thing I did before. P cap plus or minus the Z value for the confidence interval that I want to determine times the standard error. So let's see, P cap was 0.58 plus or minus, uh, 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 let's see, the z-score, I'm going to use, go stick with 95% confidence interval, 1.96, times my standard error, which was 0 0.049. And let's calculate what that is. Actually, it's still in there, so I'm just going to multiply by 1.96. Won't even have to round. Okay comes out to 9.7%, 0 0.097 I'm rounded to. So 58 plus or minus uh, 0 0.097, 0 0.097. Okay, so what's our 95% confidence interval for the proportion of people that are going to vote for Hillary Clinton? It's, let's see, uh, uh, nine, it's, it's 49 0.493, right? 0.493, or no, 0.483. 0.483. Yeah. And on the other end, it's 0.67, what is it? 677? <laughs> Am I right? Yeah. yeah, okay. So, we based on this sample, it's kind of a small sample, right? Okay, based on this sample, a real survey, a real poll would have, you know, sample thousands of people, right? Based on this study, based on this poll, we're 95% certain between 48% and 68% of the voters are going to vote for Hillary Clinton. Does it look like she's going to get a majority of the vote? <coughs> yes, right? Looks like it. Do we know with 95% certainty that she's going to get uh, the majority of the voters? No, we don't. Right? Because 50% is inside that confidence interval. Right? We don't know for, for with that level of certainty. If I went back and did this for 90%, would we, would we be able to say with 90% certainty, can we say that she's going to get the majority of the voters? Well, chances are, since it's only 1.64 and it's going to be narrower, we probably will be able to say that the low end is above 50%, the high end is above 50%. So it looks like she will, right? So that's where there's kind of a trade-off here, right? Because we, we want to have a higher level of certainty, but we also want a narrower range. So we're, we have to make some sort of compromise in between. And for the most part, that compromise is usually 95% confidence in the world. And by the way, it doesn't matter anyway because she lost the Electrical College. Right? Which, whether or not, whatever this poll said, it didn't matter anyway. Okay, so... I think that's good. This is probably a good time to end. Okay, so I'll leave it up to you guys. But I'll tell you what, I'll give you one. I'm going to ask you to do one thing. Uh, for a sample size of um, 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 2,500, um, uh, we do a survey. We find that uh, out of those 20, 2,500 people, 200 people, 250 people are diabetic. Tell me what the uh, uh, PCAP is for that for the proportion of diabetic people in this population, what PCAP is, and give me a 95% confidence interval for the true proportion of diabetics in that population. Sure, I'm gonna, I, yeah, if I remember them, yeah. We'll see. Well, I'll let you know in a second. Open recent. Okay, 20, the sample size was 2,500. And out of those 2,500 people, 250 were diabetic. Oh, 
No. My tablet died. Oh, I'm using it up, an upside down. And <laughs> equals 2,500. And the proportion uh, to 250 with diabetic. Uh, 2,250 were not diabetic. Okay. Again, this is a, uh, a binomial variable. Okay, it has two values. So P cap is equal to 0 0.1. And our sample size is 2,500. So let's see. Standard error is equal to the square root of 0.1 times 0.9 over 2,500. So this is going to be quite a bit narrower range, right? Because we're dividing by 2,500. So a large sample size, whether you're working with proportions, you're working with uh, numerical variables, a large sample size is going to reduce the size of that standard error and make your confidence interval narrower without losing confidence. Okay, so 0 0.1 times 0 0.9 equals that, divided by 2,500 equals this, and square root 0 0.006. Standard error is equal to 0 0.006. So, PCAP, 0 0.006 plus or minus 1 point, um, uh, can I undo this? C controls, Command C. Okay. Standard error equals 0 0.006. So we're looking at PCAP plus or minus Z, which is 1.96 times the standard error. Okay, which is 0 .1, 0 0.1 plus or minus 1.96 times 0 Okay, 1.96 times 0 0.006 is equal to 0 0.012, it looks like. I'm going to store that whole thing in here. Memory plus, clear, and I'm going to take our 0.1 minus the value we just calculated, and it's 0 0.008. Oops, comma, and on the upper end, I'm going to clear that, and it's 0 0.1 plus that margin. What did I call that again? That little thing that we had in subtract. Anybody remember? We called it the margin of error. Kind of make, you know, makes sense, right? Point. Oops. 0 0.124. Oops, 0 0.01, uh, 0 0.124. Oh, and this is, excuse me, 0.088 to 0.124. So we're 95% certain that the true population proportion of diabetics, the prevalence of diabetes in this population, is between 8.8% and 12.4%. Uh, Assuming I didn't make any math errors here. Did I? I think I may have done, I may have done, screwed this up. Did I? Two times this would be 1.2. Yeah, it looks right, doesn't it? No, it's not right. Ah, yeah, hang on a second here. Clear uh, 0 0.1 plus this is 1.1.12. Point one, one, two, and on the low end, that that's probably right. Zero point oh eight eight, eight point eight percent to eleven point two percent. Okay, yeah. so so I mean that's a lot more valuable than just guessing that it's ten percent, not having any kind of 
information on, on how accurate you are or how likely it is that you've actually gotten it right. Yes? I'm oh, sorry, you repeat? We're 95% certain that the true population proportion, the percentage of people in this population that are diabetic, in other words, if there's a million people, right, in this whole population, we are 95% certain that the, the true population proportion for those million people is between 88 and 11.2%. So the, the other people of any population would be from like uh, 8% to 11%? Yeah, from, eight, from uh, roughly 9 really. From 9% to 11% is what we're 95% sure the true population is. We don't know what the true population We don't know what this is. We'll never find out what it is because we'll have to test all million people. right? But based on a sample of 2,500 people and, and given the sample size, we're able to predict that we're 95% sure it's between these two numbers. If I'm willing to stretch that range out, I could say we're 99% sure it's between, say, 7 and 13, right? So there's a trade-off, the level of confidence and the, uh, uh, and the width of your margin, okay? I think that's enough for nine, right? Okay, everybody pretty comfortable with that? I mean, really, once you start to work with this stuff, it's really not that that uh, uh, difficult, right? It's, it's like then this stuff, this idea of applying these rules to samples, it's it's fundamental to what we're going to be doing in the future because we're always going to be working with samples, and it's fundamental, right? Some of it is mental, and it's always fun. It's fundamental, okay.